Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to Veterans Voices. Tonight, we've invited an all-veteran panel onto our show to continue the conversation we started last month related to firearms. We'll focus our conversation around the Second Amendment more broadly in this episode entitled Firearms Access, a loaded topic part two. We're glad you tuned in. Good evening again and welcome. I'm Nathan Johnson, host of Veterans Voices. The mission of Veterans Voices is to explore the experiences of veterans, important issues that affect the community, and to connect vets and their families to supportive resources and events. We know you're watching tonight and thank you for tuning in. And tonight we would like to share an experience or ask, if you'd like to share an experience or ask a question, please send us a message through Facebook at Veterans Voices One. Email at veteransvoices at contracostatv.org or call us at 925-313-1170. Our phone lines are open now. Tonight, we're grateful to display the shadow box of Vietnam veteran Michael Mark Anthony. Michael was an Army combat medic with the Big Red One in Vietnam from 1966 to 67. Michael passed away last year on September 11th and is remembered as a well-known pillar in Berkeley, California for his efforts in the community. On Memorial Day 2012, he shared this with fellow veterans. We who are alive, let's pledge to daily remember and honor our fallen as thoughts and or prayers cross thresholds of time and place, life and death. Let's dedicate our continuing search for peace of mind in our own skin to their memory. He is survived by his husband, Ron Wells. Thank you so much for tuning in. Tonight, we will explore questions regarding the Second Amendment with a group of veterans in light of recent mass shootings, conversations happening now in society about gun control, their military service, and other experiences or thoughts they may have. As you can see, we're also trying, to, trying out something new tonight. We thought that being in a circle-like shape would help us to facilitate the kind of conversation we're hoping to have one that's respectful, thoughtful, and constructive, where each member can be heard. So let's get started. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks, Nate. Thank you. Good to be here. And so you see everyone on the show tonight, but we're actually we're joined by phone uh, and by Skype in Kansas by Zach Bass. Zach, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. And uh, tell us real, real briefly a little bit about yourself, Zach. Um. 35 years old, I was in the Army, I was an 11 Bravo, medically retired when I was 25. Um, shortly thereafter, I married a fine young woman. She joined the Air Force and um, she got out about last year. And, uh, and I've sort of been filling the role of both her husband and caregiver at the same time. Mm -hmm. And Zach used to be a part of Veterans Voices, so Zach, it's good to see your face again. And so, Derek McGinnis, welcome back to the show. You've been a guest before, but tell our audience a little bit about you. Thank you, Nathan. I'm grateful to be back, and I appreciate being a part of this conversation today. Have the privilege of being um, serving in the Navy for 11 years, and uh, after that service, have been moving on to help serve my fellow veterans in the duties and the work I've done. I'm honored to. I'm blessed to have been married to a wonderful wife and I have uh, three outstanding young men living here in the Contra Costa County. So thanks for having me, Nathan. All right. <clears throat> Welcome back. Right on. Steve, you've been on the show before and a member of our production team here, but give our audience uh, an idea of your military experience. Background. I'm a Vietnam veteran, was a sergeant in Vietnam, 1st Infantry Division, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, served as a forward observer uh, with a mortar unit, but uh, had some time to take some photographs. So. Photography is also a hobby of mine. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. Ryan, another member of the production team, um, but give our audience a brief little introduction. Yeah, thanks, Nate. Uh, I was in the Marine Corps for seven years, 2000 to 2007. I deployed twice to Iraq um, in 04 and then again in 06, and I got out in 07. And uh, right now I'm still serving, uh, working with student veterans on the campus of DVC. And uh, I'm also grateful to be married to my wonderful wife, Natalie. So. 
Thanks so much, Ryan. Okay, so Brian, you're actually a brand new member of our production crew. No one's ever seen you before, right? Because you actually work back in the uh, offset here. But uh, give our audience an introduction. This is your first time on the show. Well, I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Brian Hamilton. I served in the Marine Corps for five years, from 2013 to 2018. Uh, I went to Okinawa, Japan. I served out in the Pacific for uh, two years. I wanted to serve out there for three years, but they sent me back. Uh, so I got out. I was stationed in San Diego, so I'm still kind of like fresh out of the Marine Corps a little bit. Um, it's just been about like, two years now. So I'm currently a student at DVC. I study film, and uh, I am not married, so I'm the single, single guy living the bachelor life. So that's me. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again, everyone, for being here tonight. So, uh, <laughs> gentlemen, and of course, Zach, by joining us by Skype. Um, tonight is an important opportunity to have a follow-up conversation on last month's topic in which we talked about um, any myths related to how the VA could take your firearms away, specific to mental health. But we're moving that conversation beyond that specifically to get more of the perspective from veterans who have served in the military, who have at one time or another relied on a weapon uh, for their training, for their preparation for deployments, or even for deployments. So, um, we've all agreed to have this conversation in a way that's respectful and considerate towards each other. Mm. And I don't think everyone in, at this table necessarily has the same opinion. Mm. Um, so you know, I'm going to play the role of just kind of facilitating, moderating this. I, I have an opinion, of course, on the topic, but my hope is just to get all of us here at the table, uh, keep the conversation uh, amongst all of us here at the table, you know, fair and equal. So. Um, who, who wants to jump into the conversation first? I'd be happy to get started. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Uh, I, I was very interested in this topic. I have a, a, a personal uh, uh, feelings about it. Uh, uh, I've been out in California for many years, but uh, uh, prior to California, we lived in uh, Sandy Hook, Connecticut. Uh, I have two daughters, and uh, uh, they both attended school at Sandy Hook, uh, but many years prior to the to the actual shooting. So we still have friends in Sandy Hook. Uh, we we sent Christmas cards. Uh, the church where they had the funerals uh, was one we attended. So it, it was very personal. Mm. Uh, one of those daughters, uh, a couple years ago, also happened to be in Las Vegas at a convention, uh -huh. and the on the night of the mass shooting. She, in fact, was, had a room on the same floor as the shooter. Uh, however, she wasn't in the hotel at that time. She had, and some of the, her associates had gone to dinner. Uh, they were coming back to the hotel, and uh, the police stopped the taxi and said, you have to get out here. Uh, police directed them to the MGM Grand across the street. And she and hundreds of others went streaming into the, into the hotel at that time. Uh, some people with bloodied shirts. Uh, it was a bit terrifying. At that point, they didn't know how many shooters there were. They thought there might have been multiple shooters. Uh, so the first half hour or so was actually very disturbing uh, for her, and she's related this to me. Uh, eventually, they secured the area. Uh, she wound up spending the night in the uh, gym at the uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, the next day, they were, weren't even allowed to go back to the rooms. The hotel gathered their gear and put them in another place. So it, it was a traumatic experience for her, even though she personally wasn't wounded. Uh, so the combination of both those events have flavored my views on weapons in general. I carried a, an M16 in Vietnam, mm -hmm. fired it uh, when needed, came back. I have not had a gun in the house since. Uh, uh, my belief and some of the statistics show that uh, a weapon in a home, especially with children, is, is a higher risk for members of the family. And so it's a personal choice on my part. Hmm. Yeah, I, um, I remember hearing about the Sandy Hook incident and feeling incredible sadness um, for those families and particularly for those children. Um, and I remember being in Las Vegas probably about four or five days after that happened. And that whole community was very sad. Went to the memorials that they had set up right there at the Las Vegas sign and walked very, uh, very slowly and completely quietly down the entire aisle of the, uh, the crosses. So very difficult time for that community at, the time, at, at that point. Um, you also mentioned having served in Vietnam. What, what do you think has influenced 
most of your opinions in regards to firearms, has it been your own experience in Vietnam or has it been the experiences of others like your daughters? Uh, I think it was my own experience in Vietnam. Uh, you know, we were trained actually with M14s in the States. When we got over there, we, we used M16s. And clearly it's a very efficient machine to kill people. Uh, you know, once I got on that plane and headed back to the States, I hoped that I wouldn't have to use a weapon again. Uh, so far, I've been pretty fortunate and have not had to or felt the need to. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't respect other people's rights to do what they want to do. I can understand, you know, hunting for uh, deer, other animals, perhaps to, you know, put food or some extra food on the table. Uh, so single shot uh, rifles, uh, some pistols, you know, may be okay, but uh, uh, high capacity magazines and uh, uh, other modifications to weapons that make them similar to military use, uh, I, I don't agree with. So you, you understand the use of weapons when it comes to hunting, uh, you even see that there's a need for certain types of weapons, um, but there's a certain threshold in regards to what you could perceive to be a weapon that could be used for hunting and a weapon that you would perceive to be used to harm someone um, in a situation <coughs> like a mass shooting. Yeah. Gentlemen, who else wants to add to this conversation? Thanks for getting us going, Steve. Okay. Wow, I mean, you were talking about your daughters, how they had to deal with that, you know, uh, over in Las Vegas. That's, that's incredible. Uh, you know, my experience with firearms has been strictly the military. Uh, I mean, I never grew up with firearms in the house. My dad never had them. Uh, so when I was serving out in Okinawa, uh, for the most part, it was just for training. Uh, but when I went to Cambodia on kind of this uh, little kind of a TAD mission, where we were actually going condition four out there. I'm sorry, excuse me, condition one. Uh, but I wasn't armed. Just, just for our audience. Yeah. Condition one means what? Condition one means you have a magazine that is loaded inside the weapon, uh, and then it's ready to be used. Uh, so we had a, a lot, I was with a lot of guys that was escorted um, due to the mission where I was at. I had a bag of money, because I, I was in finance, I didn't mention that earlier, but I was. And my mission out there was to pay certain individuals for services rendered to the United States. And I was protected by you know, really well-armed men, and I'm thankful for that. But uh, there's a couple of situations where you know, I would pay out a certain number of money to some people, and obviously, you know, long story short, they uh, didn't like how much they were getting paid out. And so we had to kind of lead the situation. Really interesting story. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's <laughs> I very interesting. I want to talk yeah. about this for the rest of the show. But, 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 what are you doing in Cambodia with a bag of money? I just, yeah, well, I, was, I was doing what Uncle Sam told me to do, right? Mm. So um, the thing was, though, is I didn't have a weapon. I mean, the only weapon I had was a K-bar that I found underneath my mattress uh, in Okinawa. And so I brought that with me and went out to Cambodia. And I was only out there for two weeks. I didn't really see much of like the cities or the people or anything. I was just dealing with certain individuals. Uh, so I know what it's like actually be in a, in a, could be a potential dangerous situation with no weapon on you and what that's like. Mm -hmm. And it really changed my mind about who I was in the military, you know. I always thought being a Marine, you have this kind of stereotype that you have to kind of be, you have to, you're supposed to be this uh, big, mean soldier out there uh, ready to kill at a moment's notice. And here I am, you know, carrying around a bag of money, you know, told to get in the van by men who are, you know, more well-trained than I am. And it really humbled me and really uh, kind of woke me up. And so that really influenced my understanding about firearms because I understand what it's like not to have it. I understand the fear that you can feel mm -hmm. uh, when you're disarmed. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I also understand people who are afraid of firearms as well. Uh, but after being trained and not being able to use it, and you know, I, from your experience when you were in Vietnam, you talk about having to use your weapon, I mean, it must have been horrific having to do that, having to do your duty. And so I don't take that as like, you know, any, I don't. I don't look at that as in some sort of like cheap way. You know, like some people might say, like, oh, you know, you should, feel, you, know, you should feel pride in serving your country. I understand some, some people might be horrified at what they've done, um, and uh, you know, it, it's not a, it's not a simple issue. You know, when you're talking about civilian firearms, right? Um, but I, I know that there's some people who live by the gun their entire life. Mm -hmm. So who am I as one person to say, you know, you shouldn't have it? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's kind of where my um, 
that really began my journey in understanding uh, firearms in the United States of America, uh, mainly as a civilian use. Um, and then uh, after I got out, uh, at first I was kind of against for civilians owning, you know, especially AR-15s, things like that. I always thought maybe hunting weapons, pistols, shotguns, I think that was okay. But the more I started doing my research and about, about uh, firearms, I learned that pistols were actually used more in crimes and usually were accounted for more homicides than actually AR-15s were. Uh, or I, I should say, semi-automatic rifles uh, that are, have an external magazine. Uh, but again, the ones that are usually told in the media are usually about you know, assault rifles or you know, semi-automatic rifles. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't know where I necessarily stand on it. I'm still kind of neutral in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily against the Second Amendment. Uh, and I don't really know how to navigate from here, but hopefully we can discuss and figure out some more. Yeah, I know for some people this is a constitutional issue. For yeah. some people this is an issue of civil rights and the preservation of that. Um, but what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is that your, your opinion has evolved um, has. mostly from your experience of feeling intense fear being in a situation yeah. in a foreign country and not having the means to protect yourself. So, yeah. um, but it sounds like some of it has to do with your perception of the media and how uh, weapons are represented. So we just have about two minutes here. So just want to give uh, anyone else the opportunity to, to jump in the conversation. And sure. we've got plenty of time to talk tonight. And of course, I want to invite our um, audience to jump in on the conversation as well. And we've got Zach by Skype as well. But um, from my perspective, you know, I, I heard your journey and I appreciate it as well as yours and thank you for sharing and it must have been really emotional for both of you gentlemen. From my perspective, I, was, I, I went to Hunter safe, Safety when I was 12 years old, followed all the proper rules, been in, involved with a hunting family and a waterfowl hunting. Also understand the, um, the privilege of being able to utilize uh, my firearm as well as, more importantly, the responsibility on what a firearm is and, and what it can do and the power of that. And for me, it's a, it's, a, it's a privilege that's been given to me that I have to nurture and honor and respect as well as the, the privilege and, and, and honor that it takes with the, the animal or the host and nature and the waterfowl experience as well as is, is identifying and, and making sure that firearm safety and fundamentals are also taught um, to my boys and, 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 and in my home on a, on a, on a value level. Hmm. Um, and, so something shared with you kind of generationally by your parents that you want to pass on to your father, or excuse me, pass on to your, to your sons as well. And also the responsibility. And the responsibility that you carry, yeah. As a citizen as, right. as well as, a, as an individual. To take a right given to you and to honor that and uphold that. Yeah, well, I like this conversation so far, and I think that we have a lot more to share, a lot more to dive into, and again, I want our audience to jump in on this. You can get a hold of us by Facebook or call us. Uh, we've got Zach, we'll, we'll come back here in just a minute and hear more from Zach. And we'll be right back after our Vet on the Street segment with Emily Rivas. Emily had a chance to connect with student veterans on the campus of Diablo Valley College to further explore opinions on this same topic and more. Let's watch. Hello, this is Emily Rivas Carrera with Veterans Voices here doing a segment at DVC called Vet on the Street. And then what are your thoughts about gun violence in America? Uh, well, you can't uh, dispute the uh, increased frequency of it. Um, that's really concerning. Uh, personally, uh, having been trained to utilize a firearm, I personally uh, wouldn't uh, own a firearm uh, today because I have no use for it. Uh, for me, that's associated with anything to do with combat relation, um, but that's just my personal opinion. I would blame the media, uh, for sure. Um, I think uh, media, instead of um, blaming the actual person for the reasons why they did it they're actually blaming the guns or the weapons no it's not the person who did it but it's the guns who did it um, the I think media they don't look at the actual history of the person why they actually did it like you know a lot of these people who have done these you know horrific events they were bullied in school they were mentally ill for many many years and um, 
a lot of these people who actually did all these horrific crimes, they were actually been reported to the FBI or police before, but they didn't do anything before till the actual event happened. Um, I think media is uh, pretty much putting all the blame on guns instead of the actual people and their psycholog psychologic um, problems. And what do you uh, think about firearm regulation? Mm, I think, well, given what we know today and what we hear on the news, uh, a lot of it's very, um, it's hard to find the cause of what makes people use them. So it's, that's what thing a lot of the professionals or the, uh, anyone who's doing the advocacy on uh, gun ownership is trying to figure out, well, what is the cause and how do we be able to narrow down that issue in order to limit the people who are using it. But it's so variable, like we're still figuring that out today. Um, I think that we have a lot of laws in place for firearm regulation, but we don't enforce enough of them as strictly as we should. And uh, also, I think we need a lot higher uh, quality background checks because people can get them very easily. You know, I could go to Reno right now and just go and buy a handgun if I really want to, or, you know, it's easy to get them here too, so more regulation. I do believe that there should be some laws um, that regulates people who have mental illnesses to prevent them to having these firearms to a certain extent. Okay, so do you feel like it's more about mental illness instead of like, because I know that a big debate um, is going to be like whether or not they restrict just solely to like handguns or like if we can no longer purchase rifles, like what are your thoughts on that? I mean, if someone's going to kill somebody who does shooting, they're going to do a shooting either way. Either it's by a, a footy automatic rifle or a gun. If someone's going to kill people, they can kill people with knives. All right, welcome back. And thanks for staying tuned in. We're figuring out some audio issues here. Tonight we're having a difficult but important conversation on gun control. Do you have an experience, thought, or question related to this topic that you would like to share with us? If so, uh, please give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, call right now, 925-313-1170. Our phone lines are open. And we've just begun this conversation, so you can join us and we'll, we will continue as well. Uh, so we're going to jump into this conversation by bringing Zach into it. Again, Zach's joined us by Skype in Kansas. So, Zach, uh, what is your perspective on this topic? I think there's a lot to be had. Uh, I know that my wife and I were down in San Bernardino five days after the mass shooting that was there. Hmm. And you couldn't help but feel the weight of sadness over the entire town. Um, it was a, I mean, it was what it was, and it was horrific, and it was terrible. Uh, and it, yes, it happens all over this country. And for me personally, that's also one of the things that terrifies me mm -hmm. and also makes me want to proactively carry. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I live in a state where both open carry and concealed carry are legal. Uh, I concealed carry because I don't want someone to get the jump on me. And, you know, maybe that's some paranoia that I carry with me from being on some of the business end of prosecuting the war in Iraq. Mm. Right. Or maybe it's just me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I hear the need to protect yourself based on what events you hear about taking place statewide, but also big influence from your experience in Iraq, make, making it so that you are wanting to be in control, possibly, of any situation that occurs. Yeah. Well, yeah have the means to fight back. Have the means to fight back, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, which is an important thing, particularly in a combat zone, is that you have those means. Ryan, what, what about you? Jump into this conversation. Yeah, I, in recent months, I've um, considered getting a handgun, um, you know, to have near the bed and you know, I think I kind of agree with Zach and I can identify with feeling fear as a result of being a combat veteran, you know. Uh, it was really dangerous over there in 2004 when we were there and people are actively seeking to kill you with determination. And so that's one reason, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of working through, uh, working through things, you know. I have a fear that someone's gonna rush up into my house mm -hmm. and I'm gonna be left unprotected. Um, 
And so that's one reason I've thought about getting one. I've ran it past my wife, and she, she's she, she kind of leans towards no, um, don't do that. And and I sometimes I wonder why. You know, I wonder why she thinks no, that's not a good idea. Um, you know, to be transparent, um, you know, coming home has been a process. You know, of uh, discovering and talking about anger. Um, you know, uh, in, in a range of feelings that you know a veteran might be left with after they come home from two tours in Iraq. So, um, so yeah. So that's where I'm at. I, I want one, but probably based on fear. You know, I don't. I'm not like a gun-toting veteran, you know, who's got to have a, a, a safe um, full of guns. Um, personally, I, you know, I grew up in Nebraska, but I don't hunt. Um, that's just something I, I choose not to do. Um, I can understand why veterans would want to have guns, though, um, particularly around, um, you know, because um, when we come home, we're, we, some of us can be hypervigilant, you know, and want, like, want a weapon, it can become part of our identity, it can be symbolic, like uh, a gun belongs with me, a rifle, an AR-15 belongs with me, and I've had those feelings, you know, and I've thought about going out and getting one, but um, something something stops me, and maybe that's my wife, but, um, you know. Yeah, you say gun-toting, and, you know, just to be careful about, like, using these, mm -hmm. um, these presumptions that people make, but what I hear is the desire to protect your family, and that somewhat relates to Steve's earlier point that maybe sometimes trying to protect our family puts our family more at risk. And I'm not saying that that's, I'm not arguing for either, either point, but what do, you, what do you gentlemen feel about that in regards to the desire to want to protect yourself? So we've talked somewhat from the, the perspective of, you know, the rights and the ability to open carry and, and, but what about the desire to just keep yourself safe, keep your family safe, and how, if at all, does that relate to any experiences that maybe you had while in country in which part of your job was to go into someone's home. And, uh, you know, when you were going after maybe a high value target or going after a bad guy and how that might relate to any experiences in which you have fear of that happening to you. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, you would run into people's houses in the middle of the night while they're sleeping. And I think it's only natural to kind of have similar ideas about that happening to you, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was, my unit was, we were all about chasing bad guys and kicking down doors. And you know, if we went into the wrong house, and sometimes we did, you know, we'd say, oops, sorry, wrong house, you know? Um, so I think there's, I think there is a fear there that uh, maybe could be explored, you know? For me, as far as family safety and personal safety, it's again, an imperative and, and also, I want to make another comment as well, if I may, but the right type of ammunition, fundamentally teaching and understanding, respecting the weapon. The boys know they've been trained. Andrea has learned and grown and discovered on our. It is a fundamental safety knowledge that's a normal and it's a, a sense of normalcy. And that will teach them more resilience and, and engagement if they ever come across a family member or a, another youth that doesn't have that kind of skill sets mm. that come across a firearm in their house. My boys will know exactly what to do. They know how to take care of an animal. They know how to take care of a weapon. They know how to take care of the family. They mm. know ammunition. They know uh, identification. They know it all. And I would stand by them in any minute of the day if they needed to do it. They also know how to... To, 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 as do I, to how to practice restraint. I don't want an engagement with anybody. I'm going to mm. pause back, and I would, but I'll be prepared to keep my length of distance as well as a personal mm. protection thing. I want to keep my distance, and I'll step back. I'm not trying to elevate a situation. That's been well thought through me and pause mm. and think. Um, so protecting your family means exposing them to this, sure. educating them on this, means that they'll know how to handle the situation if they're faced like... The, the common kind of scenario when I was a kid is you go over to play at someone's house and they want to show you their dad's gun or something, mm -hmm. right? So they exactly. go, grab their dad's gun, hey, check this out. Now the kid's playing with it and hurts himself. So, so my boys know to run. Yeah. To get out of that episode, get out of that household if right. that occurs right. at a friend's house. They yeah. get an adult and they also know to call the police as necessary because that's yeah. an unsafe they environment. So they familiarly will automatically respond in that yeah. way. Right. Um, Zach, did we hear you pipe in on, on something? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, sir. Uh, I was responding to what Derek said. I think that's so important. Um, the education. Mm -hmm. 
uh, about firearms. How to recognize what a real firearm is versus what a toy is? Uh, is that? Well, right, and and how to use it, uh, when to move away from the situation. Um, someone has out uh, a firearm, said, "Hey, look at this. This is cool. Um, it, it's it's not cool. Um, you know, you're you're a minor. Get out of the situation." But knowing how to use it and passing that down in the lineage yeah. um, is incredibly important, so that you can deal with the situation when they arise. Um, the evil in the hearts of men mm -hmm. can be a quite scary thing. So at the same time, I've had, and I'm not trying to add a perspective here or an opinion, but I've had experiences in which I think, going back to Steve's point, that uh, a firearm actually presents more of a risk to that family mm -hmm. um, because of a situation maybe in which that, uh, what, and we've, we've had shows on this, we've had discussions on this, in which a veteran, and this is not unique to veterans, but um, in which a person like a veteran might be... Um, having some suicidal ideation, some mm. thoughts of hurting themselves. And the intent of that veteran is to use that firearm to protect their family. But um, having worked at the Vet Center, I've realized and recognized in assessing that situation that that firearm presents more of a risk mm. um, in that situation. Any, any thoughts on that, Derek? And from my perspective, exactly. So again, it's, it's a privilege and it's a right and it's a duty. And I represent a veteran who has a firearm. So it's my duty to cap that to be mentally sound, come get in, help if I need it, get the therapy I need it, keep my weapons properly locked. If I need to use a vet center lock, then I do so. That's part of my responsibility, my fundamentals, my knowledge base. I, I respect that weapon. So from my journey, I understand that, and I also know the responsibility mm. of what it means if I have a firearm on my home, what I have to do. I'd also like to respond to another comment that you asked earlier, uh, military service, and those experiences that you alluded to, if I may, is. Uh, so from my narrative and my journey as a hospital corpsman, we have something called a Geneva Convention, which is a law that protects us from combat. So in my journey in reality, that means I'm a non-combatant. Well, that law and that experience did not protect me from being wounded and injured severely in combat. So it's a narrative in that an analogy to hmm. um, maybe where I may be also coming from, from protecting myself and my hmm. family. Well, mm -hmm. there's this paper written law that says I'll be safe right. because I'm doing the right thing by character and honor and You're I have a red heal. cost. Right. And I'm just trying to make that maybe there's a mm -hmm. parody to that on why it's right. important because uh, it didn't protect me there. I see that point. Yeah, Steve, you were gonna jump in here. Yeah, just a couple of statistics. Uh, I had done a lot of research and the uh, Philadelphia Children's Hospital mm -hmm. went through a whole series of studies. Anyway, one of three homes ha with kids have a gun in it. So one out of three homes, if there's kids, there's a gun in it. One of the, out of three of those guns is kept loaded and unlocked and when you ask the parents, half of them say the children don't know where it is. When they interview the kids, all the kids know where it is. Mm -hmm. So just the existence of a gun in a home raises the risk that there's going to be an accident. Uh, Can I stop you? Just I, What is our perception there in terms, I mean, I perceive that as very careless, but I don't... <laughs> I don't want to infiltrate here. That, that seems to be a careless, very careless statistic, right? So it, one it out is, of three have a home with children, and one of, one of those one out of three are loaded and are unsecured. Correct. Right? Is, are, you, yeah. are you presenting that as a careless statistic? Like this, it, this it, is, it's, a, it's a realistic statistic, and this is the way things are. Okay. Derek, I think you've done a great job training your kids, and you have some standards, and they're living by them. I'm not sure all families uniformly across the country take the care that they should. And by allowing pretty much anyone who doesn't have a criminal background to have access to a weapon, we're allowing more kids to be in environments that are unsafe for them. So somewhat similar to the video earlier, the Vet on the Street segment, uh, one of the veterans felt like we have plenty of laws, we're just not enforcing them very well. So if if Guns can be, if gun owners can, can do things that are maybe not in compliance with the law, then maybe we should enforce those laws a little bit better and keep people safer. I'd like to jump in here if I could. Oh, go ahead, Zach. respond to just that. Um, a lot of our gun laws are sound. Uh, where I have found through my own research uh, where there are these loopholes that exist is in the transferring of weapons. Uh, 
Um, if I transfer a weapon to my wife, to my neighbor, uh, to my neighbor two down the street who I don't know, I don't have to do a background check. Uh, but if I walk into uh, FFL uh, business, um, I, I have to go through the NIC system, and that's true for every state in the, in the union. Um, okay. So the, 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 the holes that need plugging are those, are the transferring of weapons. Yeah. So, yeah, one of the things that, Derek, that you said was like, it, you know, if you're having some mental health problems and you have a gun, like it's, it's a person's responsibility, like to go get treatment, right? Mm -hmm. um, kind of what we were talking about last show was this paradox where, you know, if veterans own weapons, they might avoid seeking treatment uh, because of concerns that their guns nice. might be taken away. So, like, there's this thing right where and I think I'd also just want to say like it's I think it's part of a veterans uh, in many cases like an identity uh, to have weapons to own weapons like part of our uh, psyches based on our military experiences our training um, and so you know you have this rise in you know suicide or, or depression and this like um, sort of holding tight to our weapons. We don't want to give them up because precisely of this, like this hyper vigilance also that we might have when we come home. Like I need it, I need it for protection. Um, and if I go seek therapy and actually like try to go get help, they might be taken away. So there's like this sort of you know, fear, I think mentality that can pervade the veteran community um, you know, and, caught, and, and we are, I mean, we have to also mm -hmm. say, I think we are seeing some issues with veteran suicide. I mm -hmm. believe, I'll just go ahead and say, I think the veteran community is in crisis. Um, based on the number of suicides we see each day or over the year. Um, and so this is not an easy topic. This is a very complex, you know, what, you know, that it's part of our identity, but yes. so, yeah. And I think, it made it safe to dialogue on the last week's or in the last episode. Mm -hmm. By having a dialogue, this is, I think, a very con a respectful experience of sharing of ideas and knowledge and also presenting the opportunity, in, like the last episode as well, of mm -hmm. engagement. And it's okay. Mm -hmm. Not cliche, it's okay. It's <laughs> legitimately, let's get the conversation started. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, we're gonna, we have plenty more to talk about, and I like that we've in introduced statistics and personal um, experiences. Um, we're going to come back and have more of a conversation on this. I like the way this is going. Thanks for staying with us. Up next, we share a few local events happening on Veterans Day, a new partnership between the VA and Jelly Belly, and important information on the VA sharing health care information. We'll be right back after our Scuttlebutt segment. Please enjoy. <laughs> Welcome to Scuttlebutt. I'm Nathan Johnson. And I'm Sergeant Hogwash. The Board of Supervisors of Contra Costa County will host its annual Veterans Day ceremony on November 12th, 2019 at 11 a.m. at the Supervisors Chambers located at 651 Pine Street. The event is focused on paying tribute to those who have served and honoring those in our community that serve veterans. All veterans, community members, and their families are invited to attend. The annual Veterans Day softball tournament will be held November 11th, 2019 at noon at Willow Pass Park in Concord. The event encourages veterans across generations to come together for a day of fun, camaraderie, and friendly competition in honor of each member's military service. Operation documentation will occur on November 13th at 555 Escobar Street in Martinez from 8 a.m. to noon. The event is free and is aimed at helping veterans and their families access benefits they are entitled to based on their honorable military service to this country. Former military members and their families can record original or certified copies of DD-214 discharge documents free of charge, receive a comprehensive overview of the VA benefits they may be eligible to receive, and sign up for a veteran's distinction on their state driver's license. The Department of Veterans Affairs has partnered with the well-known candy company Jelly Belly to bring a new series of flavored jelly beans, all based on smells and tastes that members of our military know all too well. Those flavors include burn pit, raw Iraqi sewage, sweaty PT gear, CLP, JP5, gunpowder, CS gas, from Monday cheese, bulldog aftershave, the Afghan shawarma you found in town that gave you dysentery, and finally, that bitter taste in your mouth after you're kicked out of the Marine Corps. Mmm, yummy. 
The new flavors will hit stores on <laughs> Veterans Day this year. The company issued a statement cautioning veterans from eating too many at one time, stating they have potential to cause a flood of unpleasant memories. Lisa Brasher, the CEO of the company, said that these flavors are perhaps best left in the Christmas stockings of people you love, especially the Fremunda cheese jelly bean. They won't even see it coming. Veterans groups around the country have applauded Jelly Belly, but when the head of the VFW tried a free sample, he replied, <coughs> these can certainly help bridge the civilian military divide, yet they forgot about us World War II veterans. What about the taste of victory? It'll soon be easier for you to get VA healthcare in your community without the paperwork. As of January 2020, you won't have to provide a signed written authorization for VA to release your electronic VA health information to a participating community care provider. VA will automatically begin sharing your health information with participating community care providers using the Veterans Health Information Exchange. The electronic system is secure and safe. This change will make it easier for your healthcare team to make better decisions about your health care. It can also help you be safer, especially during emergencies. If you're okay with the VA sharing your electronic patient information with your community care provider, you don't have to do a thing. Your information will be shared automatically. However, if you do not want to share your information, you must submit VA Form 10-10164 to opt out of sharing. You can submit your form at any time, and if you decide not to share your information, it will not affect your VA healthcare or your relationship with your healthcare provider. To learn more about health information sharing or to download and print the form, visit va.gov forward slash VLER or contact the Release of Information Office at your local VA medical center. And that's, that's the, the scuttlebutt. Hmm. Mm. We're back and we hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for staying with us. We've been talking about a very difficult conversation tonight, firearms and how those weapons maybe relate to our own experiences in the military or to the experiences of people very close and near and dear to us. Uh, we've talked about some statistics that are troublesome. We've talked about um, the, the thoughts of education and for our children and about the potential desire and interest in purchasing a firearm. So lots has been shared, but we want to talk even more about this. So um, we talked about some statistics, but Steve, you had some things you wanted to share as well. Yeah, I mean, one issue is uh, the availability of weapons. Well, there's a wide variety of weapons, and the ones that make the headlines tend to be the larger, higher capacity weapons. Uh, I've got a couple of slides uh, on weapons used in different mass shootings. Uh, if you got slide one handy, uh, it shows uh, the weapons used by the Sandy Hook shooter. Uh, there were four weapons uh, that he brought into the school and wound up killing a number of first graders as well as a couple of teachers. You compare that with slide two, the Las Vegas shooter. The Las Vegas shooter had 24 weapons. Almost all of them were rifles, what we might call uh, assault weapons, uh, AR-15s, a variety of different models. All had bump stocks, which allow it to function like an automatic rifle, uh, essentially a machine gun. Uh, and all of them, almost all of them, also had 100 round magazines. Mm. I have no uh, understanding of why these weapons should be allowed uh, for sale, why our government uh, even allows the manufacturers to sell them in the US, and why people are allowed to purchase them. Uh, are, are they a good weapon for hunting uh, waterfowl? No, but in, in, in my experiences, what have happened is uh, just even recently, so going in to get 12 gauge or 20 gauge, just a shotgun shell or an ammunition, I had a um, show my real ID, which has the California star, had, a, had some restrictions in uh, other background re experiences here in the state of California. And it, and it was very interesting. And then also recently, my wife just purchased a 12-gauge shotgun, um, walked the process. We, we did not have easy access to these weapons, and it, it, we had to wait the 10-day period. She had to go through her hunter safety journey. She had to um, provide documents as well as her real ID. 
So our going in and getting a gun and walking out with it is, is not in my experiences, or even getting ammo and walking away here in a California sportsman's warehouse or other facility. That's just not my experience. But um, Well, the irony here is the Las Vegas shooter, all those weapons were purchased legally. Hmm. And there's no tracking system. So he was able to build up this huge arsenal, which once again, I mean, that's an awful lot of ducks, an awful lot of deer. Is that really necessary? Do we need to put some limits mm. on the capacity as well as the volume or the number of weapons? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea here is just how much damage can be done uh, by one individual having um, access to just, uh, I mean, this, this slide two here with this Las Vegas shooter is just, that's quite an arsenal. I don't think I've ever seen anyone have an arsenal that large before. But it's it's 24 weapons. 24 weapons. Yeah, and um, yeah, I want I want to open up the conversation to others and how you feel about that, but also to remind us about the opinion of the veteran on the vet on the street segment, in which his opinion was, if you want to do damage, if you want to hurt a large amount of people, you can do so, um, even without the use of weapons. So. Um, having a large amount of weapons like this, uh, is, this a, is this an enthusiast who just had severe mental health? Is this, a, is this a problem in which we need to better regulate this? And looking at this, if this wasn't an arsenal of weapons, could this have been another means um, hmm. to inflict horrific harm? Right, like the idea that guns are tools, right? And they're neutral until in human hands. Um, I think that's a common understanding of this issue, right? Mm -hmm. That guns, guns aren't the problem. Um, it's humans that are the problem. Um, so. All right. Go ahead, Zach. Um, to what you uh, just said, we can't legislate this problem away. We, we can't legislate, I mean, we can't even legis legislate uh, all the drugs coming uh, across the border. Um, 2017 had around 70,000 uh, ODs in this country. Um, you take away all the firearms, folks are still gonna find access to it. Um, so there's other means so the for someone uh, to inflict significant harm. Um, <clears throat> Brian, what's your perspective on this? So uh, one thing I was thinking about was what is taking away firearms actually accomplish? And all you're doing is taking away firearms out of people who just want to protect themselves. Because you can't measure and you cannot prevent people who want to do harm. They're going to find a way to get the means, whether they make a, a bomb, like the Columbine uh, shooters, uh, they want to do, uh, they actually are intended for it to be a bombing, if I'm not mistaken, there's a little research on this not too long ago. And the idea was they were gonna blow up the cafeteria and it was gonna collapse on the students and then when the students were running out, they were gonna gun them down and they had pipe bombs with them, right? So it goes to show you that, you know, people who really determined to kill people, they will. Uh, on September 11th, they flew airplanes right into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and all they used was box cutters. Um, one of the students on the video that we watched, the segment, uh, talked about people just use knives. Um, I was also reading another uh, study talking about violence in general. Mm -hmm. And one thing people say was that, for instance, in Europe and in England, uh, it's harder to acquire a firearm there, right? But knife crime has gone up exponentially, right? Uh, people also use makeshift weapon, weapons. Now, are they gonna kill mass number of people? Probably not with a knife, but they will use probably some sort of explosive or get the hands on some sort of black market weapon. Uh, so all you're really doing, I think, by preventing people from owning firearms, whether it either be a pistol or a shotgun or some sort of semi-automatic rifle, uh, this maybe designed like an assault rifle or a military style weapon, all you're really doing is preventing those people from defending themselves. I mean, we already have laws and regulations regarding firearms, but again, that doesn't present mass shootings. It just goes to show you that law doesn't stop anything. Here we're having a conversation, which I feel is very common, in which there's perspectives that, you know, this amount of weapons is unnecessary, and even the type of weapon might be unnecessary, and you can't use this very effectively in waterfowl. And the perspectives of, well, what is the real problem here in regards to, is the weapon the problem or is the person the problem? And if we take away the weapon, does the person still have the means? What do we see as a solution uh, as combat veterans, as veterans, as people who have relied on weapons 
who I think are very well trained with them. What do we see as a, as a, a unique solution that maybe the general community, the media even, are not presenting? Derek. From my view, and is is just like our other Second Amendment is the topic. It's being a responsible citizen. It's just like all my amendments. Well, freedom of speech means that I need to be competent with the words I say and the you and I choose to use. I can't legislate what that looks like or what that could be or should be by based on values. Mm -hmm. I own that experience as my pride and my value of who I am as an informed citizen. My right to vote, well, it's my duty to not only vote, but it's another privilege and a gift that's been afforded to me by those who've gone before me to be an informed person. My right to bear arms is an example. Mm -hmm. Honoring this, 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 this weapon system and what it means and what the values are and being taught how to safely manage it and use it as well as protect my family and, and, and those around me and my community should need is another personal privilege and right that I own as a person. So I believe in personal responsibility. Thank you. Um, I believe in personal responsibility as well, but the reality is not everybody is as responsible as they should be. Uh, I, I think there's three key things that need to be done to reduce the number of mass shootings. Uh, one is universal background checks. Uh, I think Zach mentioned it earlier. 78% of weapons, are their transactions are tracked. 22% are not. We need to close that loophole. So we need to get 100% of weapons uh, a background check through the NICS, through the national NIC system. The other one is ERPOs, uh, extreme risk protection orders. These are also known as red flag laws in different states. But the idea is, is if somebody exhibits a risk to themselves or to others, or is a threat, either suicide or uh, that they might harm someone else, uh, uh, the process to uh, go through the legal process, have that weapon taken away, uh, needs to be made uniform throughout the country. Right now it's not. The third thing is maybe the easiest one and the most logical is recognize the signs of, of violence among, I'm, I'm talking about schools now, and eventually if you do it then, hopefully it helps the rest of society. But understand uh, people who are at risk of committing violence, suicide, who are isolated, socially isolated. Uh, I mentioned Sandy Hook earlier. There's a program called Sandy Hook Promise, and that is one of their key components. They have programs where they go into the schools, set up programs, encourage the kids to, you see somebody who's a loner, talk to them, let somebody know. And the biggest thing is if you uh, hear something, say something, 70% of kids who commit a shooting uh, have told someone before they do that. But the word is not getting out. Somewhat similar to suicide prevention. Absolutely. That if you recognize someone it um, exhibits some suicidal ideation, to ask them the question and to connect them to getting some help. Yeah. Don't ignore those signs. Yeah. Anyway, th those are three things that can be Very done. specific things, it sounds like. But some of it also involves some um, personal responsibility, it sounds like, yeah. in terms of recognizing the signs. Yeah, we have just about three minutes here, but um, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, I believe that it, this, the solution to this problem is educational. I believe that if we seriously look at the causes for male anger in society, I think we'll get to something. Um, I can't help but ask how many mass shooters are women? You could probably name one, maybe, or two, but I think, and not to harp on men, but because I am one, um, but I, I truly believe that if we, if we look at what causes male anger, and Steve, I think, touched on it, which is it's isolation. It's this feeling that we don't belong. It's that we're being outcast, singled out. That's when, ang you know, I think the anger starts to happen, you know, um, namely because we're sad. Um, and I think, you know, American culture um, is this culture where 
you know, you either fit in or, or, or you don't, as particularly in schools. So I think that this problem is um, really educational. And what are we doing? Um, how are we teaching and educating young people in middle school, in elementary, middle school, in high school? Because there's a lot of um, clicks, and there's a, and there's not, in my in my view, there's not a lot of empathy um, cultivated in these places, right? Empathy, real care for others, people who are different, people who don't look like us, who who don't think like us, you know. So that's my view. So. Thank you, Ryan. We just have about 30 seconds. Uh, Brian, last last perspective, and then we'll 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 give Zach a perspective. As Thank well. you. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be very brief. Um, I just think we need to actually start having more conversations like this, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, not just as veterans, but as as Americans. And we, like you said earlier, responsibility, that's the key factor. We need to understand that we are responsible for the laws in our states and our country. And that we're responsible for uh, approving which laws because we live in a democracy. And we, we have the power of the vote and we can change things. So we can change the amendment. We absolutely can. Do we need to? And that's a conversation that we need to have. Hmm. Thanks, Brian. Okay, Zach, we'll, we'll end with you, sir. You got about 30 seconds to give us your last uh, idea here of how we may address this problem. Uh, I think it's important to, to note while we're talking about personal responsibility uh, that in 2017, which actually had the highest amount of gun deaths in this country since 1968, 60% um, of those gun deaths were suicide. And so while we're talking about personal responsibility, uh, I, I think it could easily be articulated that those people took that responsibility in their own hands and ended their own life. I think both as veterans and as a society, we need to have a more fundamental and in-depth conversation about mental health and where, where to go with that, what to do with it, um, what our family might do for, when they see it, um, what a neighbor might do. I think those are healthy discussions. Um, Thanks, Zach. Thanks. We're out of time. I think this is healthy. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, thank you. I didn't mean to cut you off, but we're out of time. And so thank you, gentlemen, Zach, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much for tuning into the show tonight. We've had a meaningful conversation with our panel, and we hope that you've enjoyed it. Before we go, we'd like to share a few events and resources in our community. The nonprofit organization, California Waterfowl, harnesses education, innovation, and advocacy to restore waterfowl's abundance and to support hunting in California. Visit calwaterfowl.org to learn more. The Blue Angels Foundation is a 501c3 that was created by former Navy Blue Angels and is committed to saving lives and promoting positive transitions for wounded veterans and their families. Check them out at blueangelsfoundation.org. Sandy Hook Promise trains students and adults to know the signs of gun violence so that no other parent experiences the senseless, horrific loss of their child. Visit sandyhookpromise.org. Thanks, Ryan. And to rewatch tonight's episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable provider schedule for rebroadcast times. You can also rewatch this episode and share it with others and many other episodes on our YouTube channel, Veterans Voices of Contra Costa. So be sure to please subscribe. Our next live broadcast will be Monday, November 18th at 7 p.m., where we will focus on going back to the combat zones. Be sure to tune in. This is Veterans Voices of Contra Costa County signing off. Wishing you all a relaxing evening. And for the veterans out there, hoo-ya. Hoo-ya. Semper Fi. All right. Nice. Thanks. All right, gentlemen. Shake hands. This, this, this. We're good. still on, but it's look like. Okay. That was well done. Uh, I was